Welcome, history enthusiasts. Today we journey back to the volatile waters of the Pacific during World War II as we explore the story of the formidable Gato-class submarine, the USS Growler. From 1942 to 1944, the Growler, through her 11 impactful war patrols, played a crucial role in shaping the course of the war. Together, let's dive beneath the ocean surface to understand the intricate engineering, revisit the crew's heroics, and uncover the enduring legacy of this remarkable submarine. During her fourth wartime patrol in January 1943, the USS Growler, SS215, based out of Brisbane, Australia, was traversing the sea routes towards Rabaul on the western side of New Ireland when it encountered a fatal miscalculation. The region was on high alert due to the presence of an American submarine lurking in their waters. The Growler had already successfully sunk a ship on January 15th and two additional merchant vessels on January 16th. These Japanese convoys were always accompanied by patrol boats and destroyers. The Growler's each offensive was promptly met with retaliatory shots and depth charges, forcing the submarine to dive and retreat. By the afternoon of January 31st, the Growler had stationed itself to surveil the sea routes near the Hermit Islands, located west-northwest from Rabul. A plume of smoke was observed from a distant ship, prompting Commander Howard W. Gilmore to alter course in pursuit of a potential new target. As the Growler, operating on the surface, neared the ship and the mass came into view, they submerged. The target was identified as a 2,500-ton gunboat that had been converted, equipped with a 3-inch gun and depth charges. The Growler then submerged to periscope depth to make a submerged attack at a range of 800 yards and launched a torpedo at the gunboat. Predicting a 10-foot draft for the ship, the torpedo was set to a depth of 0 feet, meaning the special magnetic detonator on the torpedo would trigger just below the ship due to its shallow draft. Before World War II, the U.S. Navy had innovated these magnetic detonators, believing that an explosion beneath the ship, capable of breaking the ship's keel, would be more effective than using multiple torpedoes to rupture the ship's sides. Unfortunately, owing to numerous design flaws, this miracle weapon wasn't living up to its expectations. Commander Gilmore watched the torpedo's trajectory towards the gunboat, hot, straight, and normal, through his periscope. The crew of the gunboat watched the torpedo approach in the same way, only to see it pass harmlessly beneath their ship. The gunboat then pivoted towards the submarine, and the growler retreated into the depths. The Japanese responded with two depth charges for the attempted attack and proceeded onward. Thus unfolded the fourth war patrol of the USS Growler. Despite successfully sinking three ships, these victories were interspersed with countless thwarted attacks on other convoys where fortune had not favored Commander Gilmore, frustratingly depriving him of engagements with the enemy. Could things possibly worsen? Despite the submarine's eventual return to Brisbane post this patrol, things indeed took a turn for the worse. The Growler, a Gato-class submarine, was constructed in Groton, Connecticut by the Electric Boat Company. It was among a host of new submarines commissioned prior to World War II and completed following the attack on Pearl Harbor. For a decisive undersea campaign against Japan, three principal submarine bases were established, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii for the Central Pacific, Dutch Harbor, Alaska for the North Pacific, and Brisbane, Australia for the Southwest Pacific. The Growler, along with a fleet of older and newer submarines, was assigned to the Commander Submarine Forces Southwest Pacific, with the task of assaulting the Japanese merchant fleet. Departing from Brisbane, Australia on January 1, 1943, the Growler's mission was to patrol the sea routes near Rabul, a Japanese stronghold. This region was a hotbed of Japanese maritime activity and an optimal hunting ground for American submarines due to the Japanese attempting to recover from their defeat at Guadalcanal and thwart the American push up the Solomon Island chain. Troops and resources were being dispatched to Truk and Rabaul to fortify and potentially repulse American forces. The USS Growler was under the stewardship of Commander Howard W. Gilmore, USN, with Lieutenant Commander Arnold F. Shade serving as his executive officer. An Alabama native, Commander Gilmore graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1922 and joined the submarine force in 1930. Before the onset of World War II, Gilmore had served as the executive officer and, in 1941, ascended to the position of commanding officer of the USS Shark. 
SS-174. The day following the attack on Pearl Harbor, Commander Gilmore was assigned the command of the freshly built USS Growler. Lieutenant Commander Shade, a Stamford, Connecticut native, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1933. He joined the submarine force in 1935, following his graduation from sub-school. Australia proved to be a strategic base of operations during the Pacific War. However, for submarine crews, the journey to and from patrol areas up the coast from Brisbane was time-consuming. In the case of the Growler, she left Brisbane on January 1st and reached her post on January 11th, on the western extremity of her patrol area near New Ireland. The Growler's patrol commenced with the identification of several patrol and merchant vessels. The merchant ships and oil tankers that Growler came across were exhibiting defensive zigzag patterns and had substantial escort protection. On January 16th, Growler targeted the leading ship of an eight-ship convoy, straddled across two columns, hitting it with two torpedoes. However, the firing position brought the Growler within 400 yards of an escorting destroyer, which instantly initiated a pursuit. Between the destroyer, a patrol boat, and two surveillance aircraft, Growler was kept at bay as the remaining convoy ships dispersed. No further attacks were launched on that convoy. With the realization of an American submarine's presence, the Japanese initiated an active hunt for the intruder. Growler then relocated to a new region where Japanese patrols were less intense. Over the next several days, no worthwhile targets emerged and the Growler explored multiple approaches to Rabaul, known for heavy traffic and traversed up and down New Ireland inspecting the straits between nearby islands. Targets were scarce and continuous rainfall complicated the task of spotting enemy vessels. On the night of January 26, Growler identified two patrol boats accompanying a merchant ship. The process of developing a submerged firing strategy turned out to be exasperating as the convoy managed to elude them. To secure a superior firing spot, Growler surfaced and accelerated to maximum speed, not only to close the gap with the convoy but also to get ahead for a more effective shot. Almost instantly, the patrol vessels started firing at the exposed submarine. The Growler could not or chose not to retaliate as the bridge crew struggled to pin down the patrol vessel's positions due to poor visibility caused by the bright moon casting cloud shadows obscuring the patrol vessels. The Growler's only indication of their location was the muzzle flashes from their guns. Growler abandoned the attack and charted a course to a different area. On January 30th, Growler identified a merchant ship on the horizon, 25 miles from Cape Forster, Musau Island. She launched three torpedoes in a spread from a distance of 2,000 yards, all of which missed their mark. As was the case before, the Japanese retaliated with gunfire and dropped depth charges. The Growler repositioned herself for another torpedo launch, again at a distance of 2,000 yards, and fired a single torpedo. This one hit the ship's bow, inflicting damage but not sinking the vessel. Following the unsuccessful attack on the adapted gunboat on January 31st, the Growler sustained its patrol near Manus and Massau Islands until February 3rd. A message from Australia indicated the expected passage of two merchant ships through Stephen Strait on February 4th. This intelligence likely originated from intercepted Japanese communications. This process was top secret and thus typically omitted from patrol reports. Alternatively, the information could have been sourced from other submarines patrolling nearby regions, which had lost contact with the convoy but estimated its path and speed to the straits. That afternoon, the Growler identified the smoke of two ships exiting the Stefan Straits, accompanied by two patrol vessels. Throughout the evening, the Growler followed the diminutive convoy, attempting her initial attack in the early hours of February 5th. While surfaced, the Growler approximated the convoy's course and closed the gap at high speed until the convoy was within 8,500 yards, and could be tracked via radar. Given the poor visibility, a periscope attack wasn't feasible and thus, the Growler proceeded to prepare a radar-based assault. Around 4 a.m., from a distance of 5,000 yards, the lead ship of the convoy began shooting at the Growler. Shortly thereafter, the two patrol boats started a swift pursuit. Almost immediately, the patrol vessels initiated a barrage of depth charges, compelling the Growler to submerge to evade her assailants. Ten minutes later, a second depth charge attack rattled the Growler. 
This assault partially blew the gasket of the first main ballast tank located in the forward torpedo room. The damage was not significant enough to force the growler to retreat. The ballast tank flooded, but the personnel compartments remained dry. While it may seem odd to worry about flooding in a tank intended to hold water, the issue was that the ballast tank wouldn't stay dry once the water was expelled. A leakage of 1,000 gallons of water per hour made it challenging to maintain a steady depth while submerged and certainly complicated surface level operations. The repair to the gasket ensured that the main ballast tank could stay sealed so the compressed air pushing out the water could exert maximum force. Without this, the external water pressure would exceed the internal air pressure, leading to water influx into the tank. The Growler's crew ingeniously fashioned a temporary gasket using a rubber sheet and leftover deck plating, secured with shoring and jacks. After a trial dive to 275 feet confirmed the successful ballast tank gasket repair, the Growler headed towards Watton Island in search of potential targets. On the night of February 6th, a message from Australia instructed the Growler to move to a new location, complying the surface submarine set course for the suggested area at full speed. In the wee hours of February 7th, the Growler identified a ship and readied an attack. To achieve a better firing alignment, the Growler veered off course to provide the torpedo men with time to load the tubes. The submarine then circled back to launch her attack. As the Growler prepared to fire, the Japanese ship, now aware of the American submarine's presence, altered its course to counterattack the Growler. Due to the limited visibility from the bridge, Commander Gilmore and the remaining deck crew failed to detect the Japanese ship's new positioning. The fire control party, using radar, noticed the change in direction and supplied the Torpedo Data Computer (TDC), the submarine's fire control system, with accurate data for a solution, but they neglected to inform the bridge. Commander Gilmore was taken aback when he realized the Japanese ship was too close to launch a torpedo. With limited options, Commander Gilmore commanded a left full rudder and signaled the collision alarm. A minute later, the USS Growler rammed into the forward section of the Japanese vessel, between the bow and bridge, creating a massive hole in its side. The Growler had been cruising at 17 knots when she collided, and the impact's force warped the first 18 feet of the Growler's bow down to frame 10. As the two ships collided and interlocked, the Japanese crew unleashed a hail of 50 caliber machine gun fire onto the bridge. When the order to evacuate the bridge was issued, the officer of the deck, OOD, the quartermaster, and two other injured crew members descended through the hatch from the bridge into the conning tower. As the onslaught commenced, Commander Gilmore hollered a command to his crew on deck. The exact phrasing of his command remains unclear. Whether he shouted, clear the bridge or take her down, Regardless, Commander Gilmore prioritized the safety of his crew and vessel, sacrificing his own life. After 30 seconds with no additional crew descending, Lieutenant Commander Shade commanded the submarine to submerge and make its escape. Commander Gilmore, the Assistant OOD Ensign William W. Williams, and Watchman Wilbert F. Kelly, Fireman 3rd Class, remained on the deck and were assumed to have been killed during the Japanese attack. Their bodies were swept overboard when the submarine submerged. Shad took over the command of the Growler, facing the daunting task of managing the aftermath of the collision. The first observed leak was a bullet hole through the conning tower hatch. This unreparable leak led to the failure of numerous electrical systems in the conning tower. The battered Growler descended to a depth of 150 feet where the crew lay in wait for the Japanese. Amidst the pandemonium of the dive, the Japanese gunboat released two depth charges, but they detonated far enough away that the Growler's crew barely noticed. Lieutenant L. L. Davis, the diving officer, maintained his composure and managed to keep his crew calm, maintaining control over the submarine during this difficult dive. All the drain and trim pumps were operating continuously as the control room was inundated with six feet of water, and the pump room was also flooded. Lieutenant Commander Shade, his officers and crew believed the Japanese gunboat they collided with was the same one that had avoided sinking due to defective torpedoes on January 31st. The impaired Japanese vessel drifted away, not to be sighted again. Later, the Growler surfaced and the officers assessed the damage inflicted on the submarine. They examined the crumpled bow, bent at a 90-degree angle to the left. The outer doors to torpedo tubes 3 and 4 could not be shut. The destruction from the bow extended to the bow buoyancy tanks, spreading the damage to 35 feet from the bow. 
The bridge superstructure was peppered with bullet holes. The hole in the hatch was the sole significant leak, which was patched with a bolt and multiple washers. All circuits in the conning tower were grounded out. Several small hydraulic and service air leaks were present, and both periscopes were non-functional. As the day concluded on February 7th, Lieutenant Commander Shade informed Australia about the state of the Growler and plotted a course for Brisbane. The journey back to base took a longer duration, with the surface speed being diminished by 30% due to the damage to the bow and the constant struggle to remain afloat. On February 17th, Growler reached Australia and docked alongside her submarine tender USS Fulton AS-11. Over the next few days, a thorough inventory of the substantial damage sustained by the Growler was compiled. The bow section was bent downward up to frame 4. From frame 5 to 10, the bow structure was twisted and warped. The collateral damage from this structural bend included jammed torpedo tube doors, harm to the operational subsystems and structural alignment of the torpedo tubes, and contorted deck plates extending back to frame 12. The conning tower, which had been riddled with bullets by the Japanese gunship, also sustained extensive damage. Beyond external damage to the hatch from a 50 caliber bullet hole, the deck plating to the tower, and several internal systems were also impacted. The gunfire caused damage to the electrical systems, air compressor motors, hoist motors for the periscope and antennas, trim pumps, and communication cables and circuits for controlling the submarine from the conning tower and bridge. Some of the harm in the conning tower was a direct result of the Japanese attack, while others were from water leaks when the submarine submerged to evade further onslaught. The extent of the damage necessitated a dry dock for the Growler. The Bureau of Ships determined that local facilities were adequately equipped to conduct the repairs. The shipbuilding supervisor at Electric Boat Company in Groton, Connecticut, forwarded a complete set of blueprints of the bow section to assist with the reconstruction process. On February 21st, the injured submarine was moved to Musgraves Wharf in Brisbane. The Evans Deacon Company initiated the process of removing the damaged bow section around the torpedo tubes. As the bow section was being detached, Immense care was taken to preserve any of the internal mechanisms and fittings that were undamaged, or could be easily repaired for use in the replacement of the bow. The shipyard projected that fabricating a new bow section would take about a month. While the bow section was in the process of being fabricated and the Growler's torpedo tubes were exposed, workers initiated an alignment check of the tubes. The collision had resulted in some damage to the port side tubes, and there were concerns that the structural damage might have misaligned the tubes. It was found that the tubes required minor adjustments, but overall they were in acceptable condition. The Growler's bow was reconstructed in two stages, focusing first on the lower part, then moving on to the upper section. This phased approach was adopted to incorporate design changes and eliminate obsolete features that were initially built into the submarine. On April 3rd, the Growler was docked, marking the start of the bow replacement work. Exposed internal mechanisms and subsystems were inspected, prepared, and if required, repaired. On April 8th, the lower part of the bow was installed. As with any plan, its execution came with minor hitches, including the constant need to adjust the alignment of the prefabricated replacement bow with the internal and external components. This replacement was designed to fit the submarine at frame 10. To prevent distortion of the bow during its installation, welders began at the center of the bulkhead and progressed outwards. Throughout the welding process, workers had to frequently halt and realign the bow due to shifting tendencies. By April 20th, the work had shifted to the upper part, and by May 1st, the majority of the repairs were finished. The growler was undocked and subjected to a series of torpedo test firings. These tests resulted in two 8-inch scratches in the center of the shutters of tubes 4 and 6, caused by the shutters scraping against the torpedo tubes. The submarine was brought back to the dock for adjustment. On the morning of May 4th, with all work completed, the Growler executed practice dives, leading with the bow to test the buoyancy and trim tanks. After addressing a few minor leaks with ease, the Growler proceeded to another round of dummy torpedo test firings, which were carried out without any issues. From March to May 1943, as the ship's structure underwent repairs and as the bullet-ridden plating of the bridge was being removed, 
The grim reminder of the lives lost on February 7th was palpable. It fell upon the commanding officer to shoulder the solemn responsibility of writing to the families of Commander Howard W. Gilmore, Ensign William W. Williams, and Wilbert F. Kelly, Fireman 3rd Class. Out of eight personnel, five were awarded the Purple Heart. The aforementioned received the award posthumously, while survivors John A. Baxley Torpedoman's made 3rd Class and George Wade Gunner's made 3rd Class received them for gunshot wounds. Commander Gilmore, Due to his heroic actions during the collision that prioritized the safety of his crew and ship over his own life, was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was the first of the submarine forces to be conferred with this highest honor. Lieutenant Commander Shade was awarded another Navy Cross for bringing the damaged Growler back to Brisbane, assuming command of the submarine, and in doing so, becoming the youngest submarine commander. After comprehensive repairs, the Growler successfully completed five additional war patrols from May 1943 to September 1944. Her 10th patrol, departing from Pearl Harbor on August 11th, found her incorporated into a new wolf pack, referred to as Ben's Busters, led by Growler's skipper, Commander TB, Ben Oakley. In association with the Sea Lion, SS-315, and Pampanito, SS-383, she set course for the Formosa Straits area. Substantial support from friendly aircraft enabled the Wolf Pack to approach a convoy for nocturnal surface action on August 31st. Although their torpedoes triggered a disorganized response from the Japanese who fired at each other in the dark, no sinkings were recorded. Two weeks later, on September 12th, the Wolf Pack identified a second convoy and moved in for a torpedo assault. A destroyer identified the Growler and initiated an attack. The submarine calmly retaliated by launching a spread of torpedoes at the advancing destroyer. Despite being heavily damaged by the torpedoes, the flaming destroyer barreled toward the Growler, and only skilled maneuvering saved the submarine from collision. The intense heat from the destroyer even singed the paint on the bridge. Meanwhile, the other torpedoes from the Growler, along with those from the Sea Lion and Pampanito, successfully hit the convoy. By the time Ben's Busters returned to Fremantle Submarine Base, Western Australia, on September 26, they had been credited with sinking six enemy ships. Growler had sunk the destroyer Shikinami and the frigate Hirado, and her partners also claimed two kills each. Tragically, two of the sunken vessels, the Rakuyo Maru and Kachidoki Maru, were transporting Allied prisoners held by the Japanese. Despite challenging weather conditions due to an approaching typhoon, the three submarines managed to rescue over 150 Allied prisoners. However, the story of the Growler ended on an unclear note. Growler's 11th and final war patrol began from Fremantle on October 20, 1944, in a wolf pack with Hake, SS-256, and Hardhead, SS-365. On November 8, the wolf pack, still led by the Growler, approached a convoy for an attack with Growler positioned on the opposite side of the enemy from Hake and Hardhead. The order to start the attack was the last message ever received from the Growler. Once the attack began, Hake and Hardhead heard what seemed like a torpedo explosion, followed by a sequence of depth charges from the Growler's side of the convoy, and then silence. All attempts to contact the Growler over the following three days were unsuccessful. The submarine, a veteran of seven successful war patrols, was declared lost in action against the enemy, cause unknown. While she may have been sunk by one of her own torpedoes, it is likely she was sunk by the convoy's escorts, destroyer Shigure and coastal defense ships Chiburi and CD-19. The Growler joined other submarines on eternal patrol with a total loss of over 80 officers and sailors, but her legacy persisted. The command to take her down became a symbol of valor. The events of February 7th were immortalized in the Hollywood movie Operation Pacific, featuring John Wayne and Ward Bond. This film centered on the fictitious USS Thunderfish and combined several astonishing incidents from various submarines during World War II, including the USS Growler's collision. Ward Bond portrays Commander John T. Pop Perry, a character inspired by Commander Gilmore, and John Wayne portrays Lieutenant Commander Duke E. Gifford, the fictional equivalent of Lieutenant Commander Shade. The film recreates the collision, and true to historical events, John Wayne's character takes over the command of the Thunderfish. Mortally wounded, Ward Bond's character commands the submarine to dive with the famous words, Take her down!
Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.